So we are in chapter five of the curriculum. Last week we finished talking about meditating on God's word and how God's word is is a and I'm going to reiterate the most important way in which we have to know Him. All right, and so uh, through His word, through Scripture, meditating on Scripture, we come to know Him more. We're going to look at a another way that we know God tonight. And that is through providence, all right? And uh, before we even get into this, I, I feel like I feel like there's a lot that we need to discuss because as many interpretations and translations of the word that there are, when we get to talking about people's experiences, we can really fly off the rails defining God by our experiences with Him. All right? And so um, just a, a, a short working definition, uh, providence, you'll hear the term divine providence also, is uh, God's intervention into the universe. All right? That, that's just very simply put. It's God's intervention into the universe. And we'll use that terminology at the risk of sounding uh, hyper-metaphysical, the universe. Um, the universe is not an entity within itself. It can't do anything or give you anything or set you up for success or failure, uh, regardless of what alignment the planets are in and what crystals you have in your pocket. Uh, the, the universe is not a thing that is a controlling force, all right? Uh, however, it, there is a system of order that God has put into place that we understand is the universe. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting to look into uh, Genesis, and especially the first couple of chapters when we look at God creating the world, creating the universe. Um, we, we see some just really interesting things. The, the first thing is, and I like to go through this with my high school class, is... Uh, you know, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God, all right? And so just right off the bat, God was there in the beginning. And we see between um, Genesis 1, 1, and uh, we see in John 1 that there was nothing there, all right? The earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the deep as we read through Genesis 1. And the idea here is that um, God created this universe. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, um, but when we say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, uh, a lot of people would attribute this to a literary device that is a summarizing statement introducing what you're about to read. Okay, so, okay, God created the heavens and the earth, and this is how he did it. And so verse 2 describes how he did it, all right? Um, I think a, a more adequate reading of Genesis 1 is that this is the first step in creation of the universe, okay? In the beginning, God created, and that is uh, Elohim Bereshit bara, all right, which, you know, God, Elohim, all right, uh, or Bereshit in the beginning is the word there, and that's actually the name in the Hebrew Bible, Bereshit. And then bara means to create from nothing. Okay, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this idea of heavens and earth, when we see earth, we also see that the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the deep. The earth was formless and void. And so to say God created the heavens and the earth is not to say, okay, God did all this, now I'm going to explain it to you. But God spoke a universal system of order into existence in which the following steps took place. All right, and so this is a greater explanation of what happened. And so he created what we call the universe in which he intervenes into there in Genesis 1.1. All of that to say the universe is a created system of order. It is spatial, all right? It is bound by space and time. God as creator was outside of this, all right? And so for God to be outside of time and space means that God can be the things that he is. You know, he can be omniscient because he's outside of everything, looking at it like a fishbowl. You know, the fish may only see the, 
uh, reed that's in the fish bowl in front of him, but the, the person looking out can see every little pebble and every scale on the fish. And they can, I mean, they see all the other things and what's outside of that fish bowl. And so God is in a position to see things that we don't see, to know things that we don't know, all right, to be some, well, I, I, he's in a position to be, all right? To say he is some place really isn't accurate because he, he is. You know, when he says about himself in Exodus, I am. He is self-existent. And so God exists outside of the constraints of the system of order that we understand to be the universe. Understanding that when God intervenes into the universe, okay, he is doing something supernatural in the natural. And I know that that can get really confusing, all right? The English language is just so thick with some of these ideas. Uh, super means outside of or overcoming, all right? Supernatural. And so there are laws in this universe, right? Law of gravity is one of those, all right? So if God were to pick me up and fly me around this room, that would be a supernatural intervention, right? Because he defied or intervened into the system of order that is already here, all right? And he did something. That's providence. Now, I don't know that anybody here has ever experienced being picked up by God and flown around the room, all right? We see other things throughout Scripture that speak to his intervention into the universe. We see seas split and dry ground uncovered. We see the sun stand still, which we know now means that the earth stopped turning, all right? We, we see so many different things that God did outside of the natural order that we understand it is his supernatural, divine intervention into the universe. We're going to call that God's hand of providence. Now, um, what we're not going to call providence are things that work within the system of order that God designed that God did not orchestrate, okay? So like you spending your last $5 on a lottery ticket and losing, it might not be providence. You spending your last $5 on a lottery ticket and winning might not be providence. You may say, praise the Lord, I won the lottery, but it might not be him because there's a system of order established that would already put those things into motion. Now, could God make you win the lottery? Absolutely. It's supernatural, okay? And I always say, you're going to know that God did it when I win the lottery because I won't buy a ticket, all right? So if I win the lottery, we know it's divine providence because I didn't buy a ticket, right? And so... Uh, there are things that, that we attribute to God all the time. And you know what? God sets a system of, in, of order into place. And so the human body healing itself over time, that's divine order, all right? Th that is a form of providence because God set that order into place. He set the systems of our body into place to work that way. Now, for somebody to be on a hospital bed and receive an instant healing, that's divine providence. There's no explanation. It's outside of the natural. And so we see God intervening into the universe in a supernatural means. I'm always going to call that providence, okay? Finding $5 when you're walking down the street could be divine providence. Ask the person who needed $5 and it wasn't in their pocket because of the hole. Is it, was that providence there? All right. I mean, so... We get things get real dicey when we try to understand God just through providence, but we can. All right. What we have to do is frame our expectations in a way that are, that is biblical and in accordance with His character, as seen in the Word. And so, when we look at providence, we look at providence through the lens of the Word. Even though providence is another way that we can know God, we still have to have the Word of God to verify what is him and what is not, all right? Because we see God do some things in Scripture that we're like, you know, opening up the earth and swallowing people. That's, that's a little harsh, God, but he did it. And he's right and he's just.
There's no arguing with him, right? And so, man, I don't understand it, but God clearly did that. You know, we see other places where, you know, God knocks a guy off of uh, a horse and blinds him and calls him to ministry. Man, I, that's, that's a way to do it, you know? I mean, maybe not have been the way that I would have done it, but again, that's God's. And so I just go back to there are things that belong to God, and we don't get to question. There are things that God has made clear that we can know about Him. And so when we approach the idea of divine providence, we have to filter that through which, that which He has made known to us already. Okay? So, um, you know, I, I don't believe that God is going to reveal Himself or do something that would be contrary to His Word. All right? And so if God shows up, and gives you, you know, the, the New Testament part two. All right. <laughs> that's not providence. That's, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's not God. All right. If, uh, if, if God takes a section of scripture and, and reveals it to you in a way that is completely and utterly different than anybody's ever seen it before, coincidentally, completely, and utterly against God's character, that's probably not God at work, all right? And so we have to filter those things through Him and through His Word. Um, so the, uh, the more intricate definition of providence is uh, the work of God in the circumstances of our lives and more broadly throughout all of history. And so these are things that we experience, okay? These are things, so we experience that we record, and I noted some that are recorded in Scripture, but, uh, you know, I've, I've been driving down the road and felt like I needed to go another way and got to the place I was going and realized that I would have been going through the exact time a wreck happened. I don't know why I wanted to go the other way. I just really felt like I needed to. I mean, it was just, there was no explanation for it, just... We're just going to go this way, you know. I believe that's God's spirit at work. I believe that's providence. Can we read that again for me? Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, providence is the work of God in the circumstances of our lives and more broadly throughout all of history. And so I think what we need to, like, first locked down here is that uh, providence includes events and circumstances in our lives. All right. So when we talk about providence, we're going to talk about events and circumstances. Uh, the circumstance of, you know, me feeling like I needed to go a different way and, and missing a wreck. Eh, that's, a, that's a circumstance. There have been other events in my life that, you know, were, I would call supernatural that God did stuff, and I was like, wow, that's God's stuff. That's, that's outside of the norm. That is supernatural by very definition. And those are, those are markers in my life. Those are times in my life, events and circumstances in my life in which I can look back on and, and remain in awe of God. You know, I don't know if, if, if you've experienced enough life to understand that Sometimes it can be hard to be awe in, God, in awe of God with everything that you have going on. You know, you, I mean, you just seemed overwhelmed by the world. You seem just so busy. And it, and it can be difficult to be in awe of God and deal with everything day to day. And I think that's why we get providence. Um, because God makes these events and circumstances in our lives to draw our attention back to Him continually. Um. So providence is uh, events and circumstances, but it's also the work of God, okay? So, uh, again, just to clarify, you know, you buy a $5 lottery ticket and the math works out in your favor and you win the lottery, we're, we don't not, we're not necessarily going to say that's the work of God, all right? But, you know, me preaching in India and being confronted with guys that wanted to physically stop me from preaching and one of the men ended up getting miraculously healed in the midst of that situation. That's not me. <laughs> That's God's work. That's the work of God in that. And so um, 
Providence is something that we can definitively attribute to God. Yes, there are events and circumstances, but we can definitively attribute them to the work of God. So as, uh, as we look at some scriptures to understand God's ability to do this, God's uh, authority to do this, uh, let's look at Psalm 47.2. Uh, do I have somebody that will commit to read Psalm 47 too? Yeah. All right. And, and can I get somebody to read Psalm 138, 6? I got it. All right. Y'all be sure and read loud so that uh, those watching <laughs> later can hear. 47, 2? Yeah. Psalm 47, 2. For the Lord, the Most High, is all inspiring, a great king over the whole earth. All right. He is king over the whole earth. That, that gives him the authority, the right to intervene in the universe. Um, Psalm 138, 6. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. All right, so not only does God have the authority to intervene in our world, but he does so through compassion. He regards the low. And I think in the grand scheme of the universe, when you've got God on one end, we are the other end of that. <laughs> we, we, we are not like in the middle. And I, this is just some, you know, theology of human nature. Um, we're not somewhere in the middle floating. So a lot of times people like to, like to look at this hierarchy of spirituality and they'll say, well, we know God's on top. And we know Satan's on bottom. And we're somewhere in the middle, Right. Not true. All right? You're giving yourself way more credit than you deserve. All right, we're down here. Sin separates us from God. All right, and so we're on the other end of that spectrum. And God responds to us, lowly people, and and He intervenes in the universe on our behalf for His good and His glory. And so, uh, yeah, good stuff. Let's let's look at Psalm 57. Verses 4 and 5. We're going to do this kind of backwards. So if somebody would pull up uh, 57, 4, and 5, and then uh, somebody, if you'll be prepared to read 1 through 3 after 4 and 5. My soul is in the midst of lions. I lie down amid fiery beasts. The children of man, whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. All right, so David both describes a dire situation here on earth and the glory of God in the same two verses there. Okay, Why does David have a reason for hope? Why would David look at his situation and even consider God's glory in the midst of it? Let's read one through three. Be gracious to me, God. Be gracious to me, for I can take refuge in you. For I take refuge in you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. I call to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He reaches down from heaven and saves me, challenging the one who tramples me. God sends his faithful love and truth. All right. So David did not start by highlighting his bad situation. He started by highlighting who God is and what God's capable of. And he frames the events and circumstances of his life in a way in which God's work can be then highlighted. Uh, somebody read verses 9 through 11 of that same chapter. I will praise you, Lord, among the people. I will sing praises to you among the nations. Did you say 9 what? 9 through 11. 9 through 11. 9 through 11. Um, for your faithful love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches the clouds. God, be exalted above the heavens. Let your glory be over the whole earth. All right, so when we see God's work in our lives, we see it for two reasons, all right? So providence, God intervening into the universe, all right? His, his work, the, the events and the circumstances, uh, the, in which God chooses to work, He reaches down to our lowly state. It exists for our good and God's glory. All right, those are the two things that we see 
in providence. And so we see God work things for our good and his glory. Now, um, we don't always see either one of these. All right. And this is why having a good framework for understanding providence is important because when we look at things that happen, events and circumstances, we can look at those first two, uh, four and five, verses four and five in Psalm 57, and we can, we can see all the bad stuff. All right. We can see the people that are against us. We can see the, the circumstances that, that seem dire. We can see our lack. We can see our need. We can see our infirmity. We can see our weakness. Uh, we can see our inability to do anything about our own state. And that's, that's a really dark place, or at least it should be. <laughs> I mean, because it, in that is a lack of God. But God, all right, some of the two most powerful word, words in Scripture, but God, uh, we know that God sees us. We know that God cares for us. We know that God regards us. Even us lowly people, God regards us. And He will do this work. And then we can praise Him for that work. Um, I would say that if there's a situation in your life in which you are looking and saying, is this providence, all right, then these are the litmus tests for the defined providence, okay? Did it work out for our good? Now, you may have to wait a couple hours for the good to come. You may have to co wait a couple of days or weeks or months Keep going. or years. Keep going. You may have to wait years to see our good or your good in the situation. But if it worked out for your good, there's a chance that it is providence. The second litmus test is this. Did it bring glory to God? And you know what? Sometimes that glory may not come until you realize the good that was done in your favor. Uh, David, one of the things that I appreciate about uh, his Psalms is that uh, even in the imprecatory psalms, even in the psalms where he's like really getting into his feels and, and I can really relate where he's like, break the teeth of my accuser, you know, even, even when he's getting into those hard chords, he always comes back to, but God, you're higher. Mm -hmm. But God, you're better. God, you're greater. God, you should be glorified. All right. And I think anytime that we see something that is outside of the natural order of things that works out for our good and God's glory, we can say that it is providence. It's when we, you know, it, it, and we can do this in reverse too. So I, I'd kind of like to talk about that. The, the reverse option really kind of gets on more people. We look at divine providence, but we give a negative aspect to it. And so we say something like, I had a flat tire on the way to church. The devil's out to get me. I mean, you've heard stuff like that before, right? I mean, forget the fact that you needed tires two months ago. <laughs> Devil got you, right? Um, you know, they go, oh, I, I ran out of gas. Oh, not today, Satan. You know, and I mean, that's, that's well and fine, but like you passed three gas stations. <laughs> you know? I mean, it seems to me like divine providence would be when you ran out of gas as you got to the pump, as you should have ran out of gas 10 miles ago, and God miraculously stretched the fumes, somebody testify, <laughs> right? <laughs> he stretched the fumes so that you could pull into the pump, and it dies right as you get there. Like, you know, I, I've, I've been there before. I've, like, back in, in college days, you know, and I'm like, oh, I'm late for class. I don't have time to stop and get gas. Jesus help me. <laughs> All right. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, it, that, that's dumb. I just want to throw that out there. That's, uh, you know, providence again, not to say that God couldn't intervene at our request, but I think we also look at providence as like God doing the thing, you know, like, and, and I say do the thing, like, you know, at some point, a couple of days later, the disciples are hanging around and they've got like a piece of bread and they're like, hey, Jesus, can you do the thing? You know what I'm talking about. Like, I've seen you do it before. C can you do the thing? Uh, could you like make this enough for all of us? Like we all want sandwiches. 
You know, that's, and, and I think sometimes we do that. We see God work in a certain way, and rather than appreciate divine providence, our events and circumstances, God's work that gives our good and His glory, and we try to manipulate that. And we say, hey, God, well, I, I, I saw you do that one time, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, maybe... Maybe you could like break this and make it work because I don't want to have to fix another sandwich. You know, I mean, that's, that's really silly, but when you apply it to some of the things that we ask God to do, <laughs> you know, I mean, ultimately, you know, my good does not result in my laziness, uh. right? And so, yeah, God may have done that to deliver me from a situation, but God may not be in the habit of doing that to encourage my laziness. Right, but I'm going to give you glory. Yeah, but it wouldn't be for your good. This would end up bad for you. And so, uh, you know, in both ways, uh, providence is our good and God's glory, uh, His work through our events and circumstances. One of the things that we can do, and the Psalms are a perfect example of this, is to meditate on God's providence. And so if you have one of those moments in your life, if you, if you want to know God through providence, you take one of those sure enough, bona fide, supernatural intervention into the universe, all right? God's work in our events and circumstances for our good and His glory, you know it's that. It's stamped. It's approved. Think about that. David does this. David thinks about the things that God's done for him, the deliverance that He's given him. David, David thinks about and meditates on God's love, on God's mercy, on His deliverance, on His will for His people. We can know God more by thinking about those circumstances and meditating on them. Think about what you did or didn't do in those situations. Think about how you had nothing to do with those situations. You know, when you really start to look at a situation and realize that really was God, like there's nothing I can could have done to get that result, all it does is end up in more God's glory. Because if, you're, if you can explain away how you did this thing, it's not providence. Mm -hmm. All right, it may be for your good, but you're taking the glory. You know, and so when God does something that it's impossible for us to do, we see Him at work and we can think about that. We can meditate on those things. Um, and so we're going to uh, we're going to look at some biblical examples of what it looks like to meditate on God's providence because I, I think we could get hung up in our version of the story. I think it's one reason it's important to record those events. You know, if you journal, writing down what happened because you know you may or may not know this, but the next day after you've slept, you may forget a detail. Two years from now, when you need to look back on God's work that brought your good and His glory, you may not remember it quite the same way. All right, this is this is something that happens to all of us, and it's not a product of even you know age or or anything. It's just our brains are so filled with things that we can lose sight of what's actually truth. And so, one of the ways that we see in the Bible that people meditate on God's pro, uh, on God's providence. It's through the building of memorials, all right? Now, so, so there may be people in this room that, are like, are anti-memorial. You know, let's, don't, don't make a graven image, you know, and, like, we can talk about that later um, because, you know, we, we don't worship memorials. You know, they're meant to point to God and His glory, right? Uh, can a memorial become a graven image? Uh -huh. Absolutely. I mean, if, if you think about it, there are so many things that, that start off as decoration or reminders that end up taking way more attention and, and respect than they deserve. But uh, so one of these is uh, uh, Moses built a memorial of God's victory over Amalek. On this altar, he wrote the following inscription. <laughs> Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. That's from Exodus 17. Um, 
And God told Moses to rehearse this truth to Joshua in the midst of this. When they defeated Amalek, he built an altar. Now, an altar was a bunch of rocks, okay? Like, this wasn't, I mean, th this wasn't some, like, hewn craftsman, like, super nice altar, you know. Uh, this wasn't, you know, some wooden thing that you put in front of the church nowadays. They got a bunch of rocks because they were going to set some stuff on fire and it was going to please God. Um, there is a there is a deep part of me that wishes we could just burn stuff and it be pleasing to God again because burning stuff is kind of fun. But on this, he inscribed Jehovah Nisi. Now, this, this took this pile of rocks from just another altar because, I mean, if you, read, if you read the Old Testament, they, they piled up rocks all over the place. <laughs> like, you know, anytime they wanted to, to make an offering, they, just, they threw some rocks together, right? This became a memorial. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. All right? And so uh, this was important, not just to the Israelites who, who witnessed this, but he said go over this, rehearse this with Joshua, because he knew that Joshua was going to carry this lineage past this victory, past his life, and into the promised land. And so he needed to know Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. There are things in our lives that merit memorials. I mean, there are things in our lives that merit remembering God's providence, God's hand at work, and, uh, you know, this could be anything from a journal entry. Uh, I know a lot of people who like to, you know, people who build a house, you know, on the door, on the doorway, before they hang the door, before they finish it, they, they, they will take a scripture or they will take uh, the, the reason for the promise of which they moved to that place and they will write it on the doorpost, all right? And it's a memorial. And every time they go into that doorpost, they remember God leading them to that place. I think that's great. I mean, I think it's important because if you wake up one day going, what am I doing here? And you walk to that door, you go, oh, that's what I'm doing here. I don't know about you, but I need reminders about why I'm where I'm at. And so journaling is great. Um, you know, highlighting in your Bible, you know, people have gone completely digital, but like that's a really good way to memorialize God doing something like purposeful in your life. You're good in His glory. Um, you know, people, people vlog and do video uh, journal entries. You know, th that stuff lasts forever now or until the giant magnet gets it. But, I mean, you know, people do these things. People write books and memoirs, and, and they do it for God's glory. Uh, meditation on memorials has kind of gone away because we don't pile rocks up anymore. You know, and well, we, we, we don't want to keep this. We, we go through the decluttering phase, right? And we get rid of all the stuff that used to mean a lot to us. And, uh, and so a lot of times those memorials would go to the wayside. But I think it's, it's a valid source of remembering and, and meditating on God's providence that we could still use today. Um, the meditation uh, on the Psalms, okay? And so I would add not just the Psalms that we see in Scripture, but uh, Michael and I were talking about this the other day. The, the habit of writing psalms, you know, if you're a journaler, you know, and you, I mean, maybe you've wanted some God to break somebody's teeth, write it down, you know? I mean, and, and if God did break their teeth, write it down, you know? I mean, we have to remember the work of God. Now, um, I, I, think, I, I think ideas like turning the other cheek and 70 times seven times would probably negate uh, that internal, well, I mean, the, the spiritual desire to, uh, for somebody's teeth to be broken. But uh, nonetheless, I, when we want God to do something, when we see Him do something, writing it down in a way that's not just a, a time and a date, but in a way that will help us to remember and go back and look. You know, um, it feels silly sometimes. I'll just throw this out there. You know, I periodically do journal entries and um, it feels silly when I'm writing them to explain what has happened because I'm right there in the middle of it, right? You know, why do, why do I need to explain what happened? You know, but when you come back eight years later and you read something, and you're like, hey, wow, that did happen. 
man, praise God that we're not here anymore. Pray, praise God that He's done this, this, and this. Or, you know, when we write our prayer requests down and, and we come back years later and we forgot we even prayed for that and, and we've been sitting on this blessing for two years not realizing that 10 years ago we got tear stains on our journal asking God for this. That is how we recognize His providence. Um, and then finally, the meditation on names. All right, names are an important thing. And, you know, nowadays when people go to name their children, you know, they've got websites that'll come up with names and, and you know, either that or, you know, you're like, well, I like this name, but everybody spells it that way. And so they just start throwing letters and interchanging letters and even symbols now. You know, people are like putting symbols in people's names and that's just ridiculous to me, but I don't want to be judgmental. Um, but the meditation on names, names meant something. You know, back in the day, names meant something. You know, I remember, uh, I remember thinking about the names for our children, and as uh, as we thought about uh, our daughter's name, you know, uh, her name Ashlyn means dream or vision from God, and it's it's a meditation because my wife had a dream that she was going to have a little girl. Now, this was after several years of us trying. All right. And so had this dream, and then we named this child Dream or Vision of God. And so when you think about that, you look back and go, man, we prayed for a child, and we waited for a child. And there was this dream, this vision from God that there was going to be this little girl. You know, so we can use names to look at divine providence, all right? Um, not only divine providence, but to, but to speak what's going to happen. You know, we named our son uh, Brandon Kai, and, uh, you know, Kai means firmly rooted, all right? And if you've seen his feet, he, he, he got good roots there. Um, but, you know, because we wanted him to be firmly rooted. That's what we wanted for him, all right? And so naming him that, now, as we, as we look around and I look at the young man he's becoming, I go, wow, I'm, I'm glad that we wanted him to be firmly rooted because I see those roots. I see God shaping him, and he's not perfect by any means, but, uh, but he's got roots there. And so we can meditate on names, and you think about these things, they named different places after what happened, all right? And so when, uh, when we look at the names of the places, uh, we see, um, you know, places like Bethel or El Bethel, house, the, the house of God, the God of the house of, you know, God, you know, and, and so we look at, we look at these things and, and these names commemorate events in our lives. Um, you know, we have a, a family in our church right now. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to call their names out because they're not here. But, you know, when they, and they've moved quite a bit, but they name their house. Or rather, they, you know, feel like God gives them a name for their houses. You know, so when they move to a house, they feel like God has given a purpose for that season. And, uh, and so they, they christen that house with that name, and they remember what God has done, where he's brought them from, and where he's taking them to by the name that they give to their house. You could say, well, that's silly. I don't have time for that. And that's fine. That's, that's, I mean, that's completely up to you. But it's a way to remember the work of God. Because if God plucked you from one place and put you in another place and you had no clue why, but he told you to name this house something, and then two years later, you look at what God has done and you look at what he's doing in you and you go, wow, that name really kind of nails it. <laughs> that, that tells exactly what God's done and, and where he's taken us. It's a way of looking at his providence. It's a biblical way of looking at his providence. And I think if we're going to find any ways, the biblical ways are the ways we should go. Um. So I just want to pause right here, um, looking at these three things. So uh, four things. No, that's three. Sorry. I'll learn to count sometime. Um, 
So memorials, songs, and names. Do y'all have any thing to add? Questions, comments? I mean, just, just anything to bring into the mix in this? Because I think this is a place where when we, when we do share this, all right, it helps other people go, oh, wow, that may be a good thing for me to do. That, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And again, providence is you're good, but it's also for God's glory. And so if it's for God's glory, you probably need to share the event with others so that God can receive that glory in that. Um, so y'all got anything? Yeah, so we named uh, Journey after the period of time between Chris's death and her getting here. And how we got, because I had, that's what everybody asked, like over and over, how do you get through that? Grace. Mm -hmm. A lot of it. Yeah. Um, and I, I try to explain to her, because she asks a lot of questions. So I try to explain to her all the time, you know, like, well, Dave, what about this? What about that? Like, look, when, when you're 17, I might be able to explain it to you. <laughs> but so you got to, like, we'll break it down some. But I also think it's cool to be able to tell your kids at a very where they don't know any different. Like, yeah. hey, this is what you were named after. We didn't yeah. spin a we didn't spin a wheel in the process right and land on journey. Right. Or land on Roxy. There was a purpose for it. There's a reason for it. Right. Um. And, and like I said, and it's it's an awesome reminder uh, for me because mm -hmm. I can I can be having one of those days where it's you know the devil's kicking me in the teeth and it really is him and, and sometimes it's Michael too. Um, and I can literally call her name out of her bedroom, mm -hmm. like come eat supper, and I'll say her name, and go okay. But that's wow. uh, that's why we're here. Roxy is the same way. Uh, another thing on the psalm deal, like when I was telling you the other day, I wanted to do that. I don't know if anybody's ever tried that or not. Um, I'm not a big writer, but it is pretty awesome. Uh, if you look at it, it's not real hard. Like if you look at the way a lot of these psalms are set up, um, and I may be dead wrong, so please correct me. But the way I've been doing it is open up with your requests. Well, I mean, and it, and if you'll read some of them, like David makes it pretty easy to like ask for anything because he, <laughs> he doesn't have an issue. Right. Uh, I mean, God let them fall in a trap that they laid for me. I mean, it's, um, and you write your circumstances down and put them on paper so it's real. And then most importantly, when it's over, you put your circumstances and he always ends with truth. Always. Um, I just think it's cool. It's like just an example. Psalm, you know, six four. He goes into, you know, Lord, rescue me, save me. I'm weary. On and on and on. And then, like, I mean, it's like just nonstop. Uh, and then towards the end, the Lord has heard my plea for help. The Lord accepts my prayers. All my enemies will be ashamed and shake with terror. They'll turn back and suddenly be disgraced. When you start writing your circumstances down next to truth, it, it's done, it's done a lot for me. So I would encourage anybody that. I'm not a big writer, but when you start writing circumstances down next to truth, they're, even if they are bad, they're not as big as truth next to them. That's good. That's pretty cool. Very good. Anybody else? One of my favorite gifts to give people is, I like especially people who really, really matter to me, is a Bible that I've prayed over and written in for them and gone in and highlighted mm -hmm. and specific verses and written prayers to them in it, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, and I think it's, it's important to do that in your own Bible, but also to give to other people because mm -hmm. they can, as they're, you know, going oh, yeah. through something, they just come across it and see um, everything that you put in. Wow. It. So that's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah, that's awesome. It's a KJ Lee because it's not a double count. No, it's not. <laughs> easy, easy. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got anything? I mean, that's good, great stuff. Let me tell you how I ended up in Carthage, Texas. All right. Um, we lived down in Orange County, down close to Vermont Park. And my husband um, had several health problems and uh, was not doing well. And my, our children kept saying, like, we had hurricanes and our house was flooded. And um, the kids kept wanting us to move closer to them. And I knew that we needed to, but the home that we had was supposed to be our forever. Mm. That's what we had planned for our retirement. And, um, you know, that was where we were going to stay forever. And uh, we used to joke about we were going to stay there till we even went to the nursing home or to the graveyard. We weren't mm -hmm. sure which, but uh, he just kept, he was so sick and we had to sell the house. And 
um, we had come up here visiting. My son lives here, and we came up here visiting with him one day. And he said, well, Mom, would you like to go look at some houses? It was on Sunday afternoon. I thought, oh, it's Sunday afternoon. You know, no. no, he said, I'll call a realtor. We'll go look. So we went and looked at some houses, some really, really bad ones, and some really, really, really nice ones, and uh, everything about it. And the realtor, the last place she took us uh, was really exactly what we were looking for. And uh, so we went home and we prayed about it. And I just hated to put my house up for sale. But finally, Kevin kept calling me saying, Mom, have you called the realtor? Have you? No, not yet. But I'm going to. I'm going to. And that went on for a few weeks. And then finally, he called us, Mom, you've got to call the realtor. And about the house and tell me what you wanted. And so I said, okay. And I called her. <clears throat> we and um, she said, oh, Miss Honeycutt, I'm so sorry. Uh, we got a contract on our house this week. And I was just devastated. And, uh, we had put our house up for sale. And I'm praying, Lord, you know, please let us sell this house. And we put it up for sale on Wednesday. And it was sold on Sunday. Wow. And um, <laughs> So then I'm thinking, oh my word, we're going to be homeless, and know, we're going to have to live in our RV. And I, you know, I, I just didn't know how we were going to do it. Jim was not able to do anything. We had to get my son power of attorney to be able to mm -hmm. sign everything, and it, it, it was it was like a blur. It was like a blur. And I told her the day I talked to her, I said, Well, look, if anything happens, would you call me back and let me know because we really would like to have the house and. She said, okay. Two days later, she called me and said, Honeycutt, these people have backed out of the contract. I said, okay, Lord, I got the message. And, um, you know, I prayed that the house would sell. It sold in three days. I was hoping for six weeks. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> wow. the kids came and packed up, packed up everything, threw away half of it. Uh, I don't know where all my stuff went. I don't know. <laughs> but we moved here March the 19th, 16th, um, uh, of not, uh, 2019. Wow. Jim had been having chemo and was very sick and in a lot of pain. And it was very difficult. And then they shut everything down for the pandemic. So we couldn't get anything done. Anyway, we moved in the house and, um, God sent Tommy to me. Anyway, I, it, it, is, it has been really, really hard, but I can look back now because my husband passed away September 27th. Mm. And um, I was just thinking today, what in the world would I have done, you know, mm -hmm. had we still been down there? And wow. I'm thankful to be here. It's been an experience. But I know that God has his hand on everything. Mm -hmm. And and his word tells me that. And I go back to that every day. And um, I guess even going through all of this, it, it's been some really, really horrible, horrible nights and days and terrible things. But sure. through it all, I've been able to see God's providence wow. in my life. And um, I, I just, I'm, I'm thankful. Uh, but at my age, you know, you, 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 you look back a lot of times and, and see things that have happened. You say, well, yeah, that's why that happened. Or thank you, Lord, for that. But then there are also times you look back and you wonder why. Hmm. And you ask God, you know, why? Why is this happening? You know, why is, is my husband gone? Mm -hmm. Why am I living alone? You know, you just, you, you can't help but do that. Sure. But the only way you can do that is by just going back to the Word, you know. And everybody's got a solution for you, and everybody's oh, yes. got an answer, and everybody can tell you what you should do. Mm -hmm. But it's just a one day at a time thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how I've been blessed. <laughs> We're really, really glad you're here. Oh, yeah. Really glad you're here. Sound, sound like things worked out for your good and his glory and are still doing so. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm still working on it. I'm still. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Work in progress. We all are. We won't stop either. That's I've been good working stuff. for 77 years, so, you know, you would think I'd have it down a, by now. You know, it don't matter what I think. It's not a long time to him. <laughs> like that, that's, you know, in the grand scheme of people go, well, I've done this all these years. Really, that's like that to God, you know? So um, I just, I think it's amazing that he'll still work on us. And it doesn't matter how far we get or how old we get. I mean, he still has something for us, you know? He still wants to intervene in the universe on our behalf. And that's just amazing to me. That's good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, anybody else have anything? I have a question. Okay. Is it possible to stop God's providence in your life? Oh, that is an excellent question. Is it possible to stop God's providence in your life? Okay. So that is a multifaceted, it's a very loaded question. So I'm going to start by saying I'd rather not be blasphemous and say that you could stop God from doing anything. Okay, so I'm going to start there. If God has decided to do something, there's nothing I can do to stop it. All right, Otherwise, he's not God. So I'm going to start from that platform and just go, look, if God has decided something already, there is nothing I could do. I am not more powerful than God. I am in this bubble that he created and is outside of. There's no way that I could possibly reach him to stop him to begin with. On the flip side of that, we did describe the universe as a order set in place. Okay. And so there are certain orders set into place. Um, for instance, if I choose to stop breathing, I will lose oxygen to my brain, okay? And it's going to hurt me. Now, God did this little thing where, like, your body is going to reactionarily inhale, okay? So he put that little thing into order. Now, people create vacuum chambers in which all the oxygen is sucked out of the room. Is it possible for me to override the order of the natural state, flip the switch on a vacuum chamber, create a vacuum, remove the oxygen, and suffocate myself? Absolutely. People do it on accident all the time. All right? So, I would say that providence, by its definition, would be something to the, on the, along the lines of, I didn't suffocate. It's a supernatural intervention. He changed the order that was set in the universe and prevented that from happening. So in that situation, could I stop God? Well, unless I am supernatural, no. All right. Are there ways that we can use or go against the order that is set in the universe and do something that is probably not pleasing to God? We do it every day. All right. Um, I could jump off a cliff without a parachute and like God could, by his hand of providence, catch me before I hit the ground. All right. But if I hit the ground and break every bone in my body, I can't go. I defeated providence. Like all I did was submit to the order that he already established in the world. All right. Um, there is a strain of theology that would give mankind way more credit than they deserve. Um, these people tend to think those creating the Tower of Babel really could have got to heaven. All right, just, just to give you a, I mean, just a practical understanding and explanation. Did you um, hear that? Hmm? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, see, I told you, everyone is a theologian. <laughs> Um, and that is good theology, okay? It's good theology in that circumstance. Um, uh, so, God said, if they are together, there's nothing they can't accomplish, okay? And so, uh, a person who would have a grandiose theology of mankind would say, 
Well, yeah, they could have built the tower up to God. They could have got to God. They could have got up to heaven. They could have, I mean, they could have broken through the atmosphere and, and gotten to God. And um, to that, I say, okay. Um, but, real, or, um, <laughs> but realistically, we know that wouldn't work. All right. And so um, there's, a, there's a question veiled in your question. And so the question is, can we stop God's providence? I think due to the supernatural nature of providence itself, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say due to our inability to overpower God, no. Uh, the real question is, can we do something against God's will? Mm. All right. And uh, that is going to be a question when we talk about God's omnipotence. All right. And so we will get to that when we discuss the all-powerful God and what that terminology actually attributes to him and what it does not attribute to us. Um, so I know I just kind of sidestepped some of that, but I would say by definition, um, God's providence goes against the natural and we are natural. So as a natural thing, we could not impose our will on the supernatural God in providence there. I don't know if that helps at all, but um, anything else? Questions, comments, thoughts? All right. <laughs> all right. Well, so let's talk about the blessings that come from meditating on providence. All right. Um, so when we meditate on providence, we're reminded of one important thing. Not everything depends on us, all right? So by that definition of providence, God intervening into the universe, all right, usurping the natural order for his will, all right, your good, his glory. Um, there are things that can happen that don't depend on us. I, if you're like me, you think if it's going to get done, I have to do it, right? Um, but God can do things outside of our realm, outside of our ability, without our input. I mean, if you think about that, God God can work for your good and His glory without your input. You know, you don't have to tell Him what to do. You don't have to tell Him what you need. Now, He asks you to tell Him what you need, but, you know, there are times in which I don't know what I need. <laughs> like, I think I need this but I really don't have a clue. And so I'm just going to go, God, I'm looking to see what you do in this situation. And that's when we see his hand intervene into the universe and go, wow, that's not what I was expecting. Wow, you did that without me doing a single thing. You did that without me being in control. You did that without me having a say. And not only can you understand that not everything depends on you, but you can actually stop and take a breath and rest in the fact that not everything depends on you. God sees you and God is looking out for you. You know, the world will tell you, look out for number one. You have to do for yourself. And God says, or I could just do something. You know, and I think those are some of the most amazing times because there's no way we can claim it. There's no way that we can say, I did this. We just have to go, man, God, you're amazing. Mm -hmm. and, and those are beautiful times. Um, the next side of this is going to touch a little bit on that uh, question that you asked. But the second thing is, and, and this is loaded, and so before you gasp, let, give me a second. We can never truly fall outside of God's will. Okay? We can never truly fall outside of God's will. Okay? Because He's omnipotent. He's outside of everything. He is supernatural. Right? And so, uh, for us to accidentally get to this place in which we're in a place where God can't intervene, that, that's what I'm saying here is like there's no place that you can go to, no hole that you can fall into 
in which God cannot reach. Because he is God, by very nature, he is outside of this whole thing. Not only can he reach your situation, but he can see what you need three situations from then, and he may leave you in that situation so that you can get in through that situation three situations from now, right? And so to think, oh, I'm outside of God's will. You know, people do things like, uh, yeah, I was in youth ministry for uh, 10 years, and I say, like, I'm done. I still teach high school uh, Bible classes. But um, where should I go to college? What job should I pursue? Well, I just want to be in God's will. You know, what? who should I marry? Who, and, and, like, we, we take a lot of things that we think are really big until you, like, live a little while, <laughs> you know. And we say, well, I don't want to be outside of God's will. Like, if we make one wrong move, we've gotten past the fence, <laughs> you know? Like, we take one step, we make one decision, and that decision may lead to 10 years of depravity or 10 years of poverty or 10 years of depression. Or I mean, that one decision could snowball, but you're still not outside the reach of God. And if you're not outside the reach of God, how could you be outside the will of God? Like, I mean, to think, all right, look, big guy, because that's kind of the attitude you take when you say, I could get outside of his will, all right? Look, big guy, I know you got plans for me, but I'm going to do this over here. You know, that could be the case. He could have something that he would like for you to do. I've known a lot of people that were supposed to be in ministry, and they chose drugs, and promiscuity, and everything that would lead them away from God, only to 20 years later be in the ministry. Like, we see this much, and God sees all of it. God doesn't see this much. He sees all of it, all right? He sees three generations from now, you know? And so to say that we could fall outside of His will is really to take away some things that belong to God, His, his all-powerfulness, His all-knowing. Because if God knows everything, how could you do something that He hasn't made a plan for already? And if you get to do anything, it's because He let you do that thing. I mean, think about it. He lets you breathe. He lets you walk down the hall without rolling an ankle, all right? He lets you do those things. He'll also let you roll the ankle when you're walking on flat ground. I know for a fact he will. It's happened, all right? But he's sovereign. This belongs to him. You belong to him, whether you are in him or not. And so even the lost still belong to him. They're not hidden in Him. They're not, they don't have salvation. They're not protected by Him. But they can't change His will. They're not more powerful than Him. Oh, I don't believe in you, so I'm more powerful than you. It's a self-defeating argument, by the way. Um, but it's just it, it's really odd that we attribute these things to ourselves and, and we, we have this grandiose idea of our ability to mess up just because we're good at it, right? But there is no mistake, no decision, no choice even, no conscious effort that could get you outside of God's ability to control and stick his hand in the middle of that. And so meditating on providence helps us remember these things. Um, <clears throat> another blessing is that we can share God's work with other people. You know, the testimonies that, that y'all shared. Like we become part of the God's glory in the providence equation right? He does something for our good, and then we brag on our God, right? We give Him glory in the midst of it, and as we give God glory, other people see Him and turn to Him, and they can experience His providence. They can experience, first and foremost, salvation because of our testimony, all right? And then, uh, you know, people, I've, excuse me, I've known people who, uh, 
who have had life-changing encounters with God, not through an evangelist, not through a message, but from somebody going, man, you wouldn't believe what happened to me yesterday. I've seen it happen. You know, man, I, I was doing this and this and this. God is so good. He did this and, and, and he did this. And people go, man, God's good, you say. I don't know that God is good. How could I know that God is good? People come to know God through our testimonies. And, and so, uh, and that's a blessing. People think, well, you know, evangelism is scary. You know, no, it's a blessing to, to be used in the most important aspect of someone's life. You know, people, people want to glamorize, you know, our heroes of today. And I don't want to take anything away from anybody that you would consider a hero. But, you know, we talk about um, first responders. Man, those guys are heroes. They run into burning buildings. But what they do is for this much of eternity. And when we give glory to God because of His work in our life, we make an impact in eternity, not just here. So I'm not saying that those people aren't heroes, but I'm saying what God has done in you and you giving glory to Him has a deeper impact in the world than people that we like stand up and salute all the time. I mean, we're talking eternity, not, not a nation that could be around another hundred years or could get you know debts called in and we'd be Chinese before the turn of the century. I mean... You know, I pray God that doesn't happen, but I'm just saying, like, the stuff that we have here is not promised. But we are promised eternity one way or another. And when we give God glory for His work, we have a hand in that eternity being different for somebody else. Super important. Um, and then lastly... Uh, this lists some, some tips for meditating on providence, and I'm going to read these off. Um, you, you may or, or may not need these, but uh, for the sake of ministering to a broad audience, we're going to read these out. Um, much of the advice about meditating on God and His Word also applies here. And so if you would do these things with the Word, you could also do these things meditating on His providence. Uh, the first is find a quiet place and time to think deeply without distraction. Okay, get alone, let it be quiet, and think about what God has done, not hard. Um, number two, submit your meditation to the truth of Scripture. And this was my warning at the beginning of it because... <coughs> Our minds will let us skew God's plan. All right, we're just we're we're depraved that way. Um, we know in part and we prophesy in part, is what Paul says. And so, submit your thoughts about God's providence to the Word. Does it match up with Scripture? Um, number three, rehearse what you've learned and connect it to other truths. If God has revealed Himself in a certain way and you have seen that clearly, and it's, in, and it's in harmony with Scripture, that's something you can take to the bank. God is watching. God pays attention to me. God sees me. You know, that's one of the things that we know from Providence is God is watching. You can find other places in Scripture where people realize God is watching. God sees me. Hagar, all right, she said, you're the God that sees and so when you see that, you can begin to go, hey, you know what? I know this about God. He sees me. All right? And that's no longer an obscure story from the Old Testament. That is a personal revelation of God and a truth that you can take to the bank. Fourth, make time to praise God for His goodness. Um, again, I, I think when you do the, the song thing, you know, glorifying God and speaking that truth about God at the end, um, telling other people about what God has done, it's so important. And then lastly, record your thoughts in a journal for future review. And we talked about that earlier. Um, some things that you can uh, consider in the midst of this. Um, consider God's timing. You know, think about it. Hindsight and retrospect I look at some of the things that God has done in my life and it, and it helps me to realize that those things didn't happen when I was really, really, really working to have something happen. 
They happen when I was really, really broken or really, really humbled or really, really submitted to God when those acts of providence happen. And so, you know what? I can go, hmm, maybe, just maybe, I'm not going to see God's providence at work when I think I'm the most awesome thing in the world. Maybe I should practice being a little more humble if I want to see God's hand at work in my life. So you can consider God's timing in those things. Uh, consider the forerunners of God's providence. And this is kind of similar to what I just described because there have been situations in which I finally realized I was helpless to do anything. And when I went, okay, I quit. I'm going to stop trying to be God. I'm going to stop trying to, to take the role of God in my life. And I saw Him work in miraculous ways. A lot of times the forerunners of providence are triggers for us, are, are things that God is fixing in us, or situations that seem overwhelming. And so when we look to those situations and we start to get overwhelmed, we can go, wait a minute. All this happens every time. I get worried, I get caught up, and it's more than I can bear. I freak out, and then God works. Maybe this time I'm going to try not to freak out. Maybe this time I'm going to submit it to Him sooner. Maybe this time I'm not going to try to fix it before I ask Him to fix it, right? And so we can see the forerunners that uh, lead to God's providence. And then uh, let's consider the tools of God's providence. There are things that God uses in our lives, and He does it regularly. And sometimes we're oblivious to them, all right? I know for years... Um, uh, God's tools of providence uh, were usually a, a voice telling me, yeah, I don't think you can do that. Not a negative voice, but a positive voice going, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Slow down. Hey, you know, God uses other people in that. God will use scripture. Uh, there have been times in which uh, God has just dropped a scripture in my spirit and it was burning there. And I went, God, okay, I'm just going to think about this scripture. And when I was focusing on that truth, I saw that truth in reality. God's providence at work according to that truth. And so God will use scripture in the midst of that. Um, consider the providence or consider providence that reflects God's promises from scripture. All right, so uh, likely you have times in which God did something just like His Word says. And you're just still amazed that God did what He said He would do, which is really speaks to like our slowness in the midst of everything. But when you see God do exactly what Scripture says, man, you can think, oh, well, man, if God says that He's going to provide, He's going to provide. We just come through a season of that. And it's, it's sad to me that like there was so much anxiety over the first several months of this past season we've been in as to whether God was going to provide. And lo and behold, Scripture said He would provide, and He provided. You know, and so, you know, I'm here face palming, going, I, I should have known, but uh, there's promises in that. Um, Romans 8, 28 is a big promise. God works all things together for the good of those uh, who are who love Him and are called according to His purposes. And so, like, God works all things together for good. It doesn't mean that God prevents bad stuff from happening. It means He even uses the bad stuff for your good. Um, again, your good, His glory. And then lastly, consider God's character as revealed by His providence. All right? Is God trustworthy? You can say God's trustworthy, but until He's come through in the clutch... You may not be as easy to trust Him, you know, but when you see, hey, I can trust God, man, you know what? God is, God is watching me. You know what? God's powerful enough to do even this. When we see God's character revealed in His providence, we begin to trust Him more and know Him more and love Him more. And I'm going to tell you, you see His providence more. A lot of God's providence, we're just untrained to look at because we don't know Him well enough. And so the more we know Him, the more we meditate on His Word and His providence, we begin to understand who He is and how He does things, and we notice that He does things even more. So, thoughts, questions, comments on those blessings and the tools for uh, meditating on providence.
Providence, not Providence. <clears throat> Anything? All right, this is this is a good one. And again, like I said at the beginning, you know, we can we can misconstrue God sometimes. Um, we can see a situation and we can interpret it one way and. I think it's just really important that we, you know, I'll sandwich this, the beginning and the end. When we meditate on God's character through providence, we have to consider the Word. We have to consider what He said about Himself already. Because if, if we look at a situation and we're like, I'm just trying to pick something out of thin air. Let's, I mean, let's say... The other night, coming back from a basketball game, um, we went into Burger King, and uh, I had my meal paid for by Burger King because they take care of coaches, I guess, in that chain of Burger Kings. And so I got a free meal from Burger King because I was coaching a basketball team. And uh, Jessica got one for being a teacher because they take care of coaches and teachers. And that's amazing. Now... I could say, well, you know, God gives free Burger King away. That's my God. And that seems really silly, but if you turn on the TV and flip a couple of channels, you may find somebody trying to say something like that, okay? <laughs> God gives free Burger King away. I've seen it happen. I'm here to testify to the goodness of God and the freeness of Burger King for those who believe. Can I get a hallelujah? The problem is, the problem is that was a system developed by mankind. And you know what? I'm going to praise God that I got free Burger King because I like free stuff. Who doesn't? Okay? But, but if I started telling everybody, look, man, you know God loves you when he gives you free Burger King. What are all those poor people paying for their own Burger King going to think about God? Oh, he must not love me. Uh -huh. Huh. I went into Burger King without money. They sent me right back out. I don't know about this whole Christianity thing. Uh -huh. I don't know about this God. I mean, why would God give him free Burger King and not me? Because, you know, people are super concerned about free Burger King. Um, I am, apparently. Well, but you're on to something, man. But the thing is, is like, there's no place in Scripture that says God gives free Burger King. There's not even the place in Scripture that said God gives free meals. It says He provides. It says He'll do in His time what He wills. And so, you know what? Could God have intervened in the natural order of things to make Burger King free for me that night? He could have. I think there's some systems in place in which, you know, people have a, a uh, morality structure that makes them feel better for giving to coaches and teachers. And so I got free Burger King based on the depravity of man. That's what I think happened. All right. Um, but, but just because something happens doesn't mean that God did it. Just because something good happens doesn't mean that God did it. Just because you try to glorify God for something he didn't do doesn't mean that it's providence. We have to bring it back to the Word. Now, if you can find a place in the Word where it says the good Lord giveth Burger King and the good Lord taketh away Burger King, well, then I have to understand that, like, next time they may come out and take my meal from me, you know? And I have to glorify God in the midst of that process, too. All right, and that's going to be real difficult for me. All right? Um, but we just have to understand everything goes through Scripture. Everything through the filter of Scripture. Everything through the filter of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see God work in our events and circumstances for our good and His glory. Y'all got anything else? Y'all get free food anywhere? You want to get praise God for it? All right. Well, uh, I'm going to close this with a word of prayer, and then y'all are free to hang around and talk if you want to. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your hand at work in our lives. Thank you that you do... Uh, God, you reach down supernaturally into the natural and you do things for our good and your glory. God, I pray that we wouldn't serve our good, but that we would serve your glory. God, I pray that we would see your glory as your glory and not our own. 
God, as you, as you move and work in our lives, help us to remember, help us to meditate on your providence. God, help us to, uh, to create memorials, God, to, to write down what you've done, to uh, let names uh, mean something. God, I pray that you would just uh, help us to experience you more, God, as we learn more about you and who you are. Help us to look for you and to look for your hand of providence at work in our lives, God, so that we can glorify you. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would just continue us on, the, on this journey to, um, to help us understand you and your word. God, I pray that you would bless our efforts, uh, that you would just correct those things in us that would uh, be false or wrong, that you would straighten out the crooked paths in front of us, God, and that we would have a true understanding of who you are and that we would worship you accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.